My name is Karel Frakapan, and I lead UNESCO's programs on educating about the Holocaust and genocide, and addressing hate speech and anti-Semitism through education. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event organized by UNESCO and the USC Shoah Foundation to launch our joint webpage for teachers on addressing anti-Semitism through education. Ladies and gentlemen, anti-Semitism is on the rise globally, posing an increasing threat to Jewish communities and to our societies as a whole. The popularity of social media has increased young people's encounters with anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories, notably during the COVID-19 pandemic, and other forms of hate speech in all regions of the world, necessitating new forms of digital citizenship for the internet era. Young people need to learn to recognize and resist manifestations of anti-Semitism, whether they occur in the online or offline world. Their education must be infused with the values of global citizenship education so that they may dismantle inflammatory language, stereotypes and prejudice. Teachers and educators, too, need to be provided with the training, support and resources to take on this challenge in their classrooms. This is the purpose of the new webpage we are launching today on the USC Shoah Foundation's Eyewitness web platform. It provides teachers with helpful guidance and video testimony-based digital resources, building on training materials developed by UNESCO and the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in partnership with the University College London Centre for Holocaust Education. Mesdames et messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to reflect on the power of education, its power to bring people together and to foster mutual understanding, its power to bring about world citizens better equipped against the rhetoric that seeks to divide, exclude and destroy, its power to support the universal principles of human rights and the respect of fundamental freedoms. These are the values on which UNESCO's mission is based. Without further ado, I have the honor to give the floor to Mrs. Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Education. Her welcome speech will be followed by a message from Katerina Riabico, First Deputy Director of the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. I'm very honored to launch our new eyewitness website for teachers on the prevention of anti-Semitism through education. At the outset, I wish to warmly thank you partners the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the University College London, and University of Southern California Shoah Foundation UNESCO Chair for Genocide Education that it's hosting the website. Well, anti-Semitism is rising across the world. It's cultivated in ideologies that are anchored in hate. It permeates through societies confronting Jewish communities with hostility and violence feeding conspiracy theories and violent extremist messages from all sides of the political spectrum. It's a hate that breeds in the digital world, often behind pseudonyms and anonymous accounts, causing harm and violence in the physical world. A threat that has only amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. As Jewish communities are confronted by hatred, it's the responsibility of our global community to react and respond, to build stronger defenses that safeguard the human rights and dignity of all. Well, UNESCO is deeply committed to this task. We support member states worldwide to combat anti-Semitism, intolerance and discrimination as a central component of UNESCO's flagship program on global citizenship education and as our contribution to the UN strategy and plan of action of hate speech. With the Office uh, for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights of the OSCE, UNESCO published the very first ever guide for education policymakers and training curricula on addressing anti-Semitism. The same responsibility also falls on educators, of course, on textbook writers, and curriculum developers to accurately and empathetically raise awareness of others' histories and cultures. Well, it falls on teachers, it falls on school directors and on the wider school community. And not only 
to address incidents of anti-Semitism should they occur, but to create safe learning environments that uphold human rights, that promote critical thinking and guarantee respect for others in all of their diversity. It stands to reason that we must therefore support educators in this critical, essential task. That is why UNESCO, the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and the USC Shoah Foundation proudly launch this, web, this website today, providing teachers with helpful guidance and video-based digital resources to teach about anti-Semitism in schools. Based on UNESCO and ODR, uh, a set of uh, four training curricula addressing anti-Semitism in schools, the website is testament to the power of international collaboration and cooperation. It promotes learning materials in multiple languages from schools, museums, organizations from across the world. And it also amplifies the voices of individuals who experience anti-Semitism during and after the Holocaust, as well in contemporary times. Through education, we can invite learners to actually recognize our shared humanity. It can inspire them to, to stand up to anti-Semitism, discrimination, and other forms of intolerance. It can also keep them with the right skills, skills to resist conspiracy theory and violent ideologies. It can empower youth to think and be the change they want to see in the world. I thank the US Shoah Foundation for their continued commitment to such an immense and huge task. I wish also to express my gratitude to Irene Kotl, Canada's special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism, and to the government of Canada for supporting UNESCO in its efforts to promote Holocaust education globally. In partnership with the UN uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum, I share my thanks to uh, uh, Rabbi Baker, personal representative of the OSC chairperson in office on combating anti-Semitism, the American Jewish Congress and the Anti-Defamation League for their leadership and resolve in addressing anti-Semitism, both in North America and globally. Well, finally, I, I wish to invite teachers educators to make use of these rich resources, these tools, in support of their strong efforts to, to read the word of anti-Semitism, of intolerance and hate. UNESCO really stands with you in this uh, shared, important, essential mission. I thank you very much. Your Excellencies, Professor Giannini, Professor Kortler, Rabbi Baker, distinguished speakers, dear participants. It is a true honor for me to address you today at this very important webinar dedicated to countering anti-Semitism through education. As we have recently learned through gathering data from our 57 participating states for our biennial publication, Holocaust Memorial Days, an overview of remembrance and education in the OEC region, technology plays an increasingly important role in education. A number of states have recognized this and began to harness the power of the eyewitness program in order to engage students with first person stories from survivors and witnesses. We are therefore all the more delighted that uh, the joint OEC ODIR and UNESCO materials for policymakers and teacher and school director trainers now feature on the USC Shaw Foundation's eyewitness platform which is a remarkable hub uh, of insightful resources and knowledge that help guide students towards empathy and build their resilience to anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred. Yet anti-Semitism continues to proliferate in various forms and in various spaces, particularly online. Jewish people are again targets of conspiracies and scapegoating and as anti-Semitic and other hateful narratives continue to spread at increased velocity on social media platforms, in particular reaching and affecting so many young people. Like 
all forms of intolerance and discrimination, anti-Semitism has concrete effects on societies at large. Sending a message of exclusion and instilling fear in all those who are targeted by it. We know that whenever it occurs, anti-Semitism poses threat not only to Jewish people, but also to other minority and vulnerable communities. Left unchallenged, it ends up undermining the human rights of all, as well as democratic values and social stability. The 57 OEC participating states have on numerous occasions, occasions committed to combat anti-Semitism and other forms of intolerance and discrimination, at the same time understanding that in order to address the root causes of such phenomena, education and awareness raising a key. Education and educators are uniquely placed to confront the, um, the anti-Semitism and hate. They are in a position to shape but also change attitudes to instill the values of human rights and respect for human dignity, to empower and inspire, to build critical thinking and resilience to prejudice, extremist narratives, conspiracy thinking, and the toxic ideologies that drive discrimination and hatred. Educate, educators also have a duty to create uh, school environments that are safe and inclusive of Jewish and all other students. This important work for our societies depends on educators committing to this critical task, but equally on the existing education frameworks that foster such, such commitment and the opportunities educators have to build their knowledge and skills in this area. This is exactly why it is so vital to utilize the resources presented today in order to support educators and policymakers in this critical endeavor, and to gain further insights from today's distinguished speakers on the role of education and educators in countering anti-Semitism. I would like to wish all of us today to have fruitful and productive events, to learn from each other, and thank you for your attention. We are very honored to be joined by Rabbi Andrew Baker, the personal representative of the OSC Chairperson in Office on Combating Anti-Semitism and Director of International Jewish Affairs at the American Jewish Committee to deliver keynote remarks. Rabbi Baker has been a leading figure in the fight to combat discrimination and in particular anti-Semitism. And I would like to thank him and the American Jewish Committee for their efforts in this regard. Nearly 20 years have passed since a resurgence in anti-Semitism in Europe set in motion regional and international efforts to understand it and to combat it. Governments were slow to recognize it and later reluctant to acknowledge it. But in time, with the forceful efforts by Jewish communities, by civil society organizations, coupled with the very real and increasing number of anti-Semitic attacks, the problem could no longer be ignored. The OSC organized the first conference by any international governmental organization to address the problem. The EU's Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia conducted its first study on anti-Semitism in the European Union. Those OSCE efforts led to the Berlin Declaration of 2004, which alerted participating states to the dangers of both old and new forms of anti-Semitism and enumerated steps to be taken to address it. Later that same year, the EUMC drafted a working definition of anti-Semitism with clear examples that would enable government officials and civil society alike to better identify the problem and thereby address it. The immediate problem was, and sadly, in many places it still remains, providing for the security of Jewish communities. This has included the enhanced physical protection of synagogues, schools, and other communal buildings, increased surveillance and, and police protection, uh, and greater coordination between Jewish community professionals and government authorities. The threats include both lethal terror attacks and the far more common 
verbal and physical harassment. Surveys then and now reveal that significant percentages of Jews in Europe and in America will avoid wearing anything in public that identifies them as Jews, and some even avoid attending Jewish events for fear of encountering anti-Semitism. Thus, it was appropriate that Odir's Words into Action project first address the challenge of Jewish community security. But as we all know, security is no long-term solution. Our real hope for combating and reversing anti-Semitism has always been education. Virtually every declaration or resolution or expert conference has stressed the importance of education. And yet if we speak candidly, our understanding of what that education should be and how it would work has been quite limited. Those earliest declarations emphasize the importance of Holocaust education. No one would take issue with this. It is important in its own right. It was the seminal event in the 20th century history of many of the countries where anti-Semitism persists. It is a clear warning that left unchecked Anti-Semitism can lead to violence and murder and even genocide. But by itself, is it effective in reducing anti-Jewish prejudice? Portraying Jews as only victims obscures the long and rich history of Jewish life in Europe and the contribution to the greater society made by those Jews. In some places, it even seems to foster resentment rather than empathy. This is why the Words into Action project addressing anti-Semitism through education is so significant. Developed in partnership by ODIR and UNESCO, working with University College London and the USC's Shoah Foundation, it builds on Holocaust education and the firsthand testimony of survivors, but takes it so much further. We now have a complete and comprehensive curriculum from primary grades through secondary school. We have thoughtful questions for teachers and school administrators to help them understand their own role and responsibility for not only teaching about anti-Semitism, but also eliminating it from their classrooms and from their schools. We owe a debt of gratitude to those organizations uh, that are gathered here today to the dedicated individuals from them who have labored to bring this about and who have made today's launch possible. And so we say for them, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazek, may they go from strength to strength. And let us hope that we here with, with this program strike a body blow in the fight against anti-Semitism. Thank you, Andrew Baker. I'm now very honored to give the floor to Professor Erwin Cutler, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and Canada's Special Envoy on Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism, for a keynote address. I'm delighted to participate in this important educational initiative that has been organized by UNESCO in partnership with the OSCE, ODIR, and the Shoah Foundation, which is as timely as it is necessary. For we are witnessing, uh, experiencing an old, new, escalating, global, and resurgent anti Semitism. One that is grounded in classical anti Semitism, but is distinguishable from it. Where anti Semitism is not only the oldest, longest, most enduring, and most lethal of hatreds, but one which mutates and metastasizes over time. And indeed, at this point, as my colleague Ahmed Shahid has put it, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, anti-Semitism is toxic to democracies. It is an assault on our common humanity. In a word, anti-Semitism at this point is the canary in the mineshaft of global evil. And it is becoming in increasingly mainstreamed, normalized in the political culture, and therefore education, and particularly 
the tailored education that you engage in, education with respect to primary schools, secondary schools, vocational schools, university, and the like, is exactly the kind of global approach that is needed with respect to being an antidote to this globalizing, globalizing anti-Semitism, which helps build global citizenship and protects a rules-based international order. Indeed, the importance and imperative of education was an organizing theme of Canada's summit, national summit, first ever on combating anti-Semitism this past summer, and on Canada's recent country pledges to the Malmo, the Swedish Malmo Conference on Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism, and where education underpins both the national action plan and the global action plan to combat anti-Semitism, which frames my work as special envoy and includes the following. Number one, the importance, indeed the imperative of Holocaust remembrance and <coughs> commemoration. Le devoir de mémoire, the responsibility of remembrance and the danger of forgetting. Where in the recent Holocaust Education Month here in Canada, the lessons of Kristallnacht were an organizing theme, that Kristallnacht did not happen by accident, but it was la trahison des clercs, the betrayal of the elites, the indifference of the bystanders, and the ongoing toxicity of anti-Semitism that was the precursor to the Holocaust. The second is the importance not only of Holocaust education, but education regarding anti-Semitism, of the Holocaust as a paradigm for radical evil, as education, as anti-Semitism is a paradigm for radical hate. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism did not die in Auschwitz. And as I said, it remains the bloody canary in the mineshaft of global evil, which leads to a third important imperative respecting uh, the education that you engage in, and that is the increasing threat of Holocaust distortion. And here, uh, IRA has teamed up with UNESCO and others in order to organize a campaign to protect the facts. Again, a campaign that is as timely as it is necessary, for we are witnessing not only the resurgence of classical uh, tropes of the Jews as the poisoners of the wells, but of the instrumentalizing of the COVID-19 pandemic for that purpose, where Jews, the Jewish people in Israel, are blamed for manufacturing the COVID virus, for causing its spread, and even for profiting from it. Number four is the alarming rise in both hate speech and hate crimes, reminding us of what the uh, Supreme Court of Canada said in an important trilogy of cases that constitutionalized anti-hate legislation in Canada where the court said the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chambers. It began with words. These, as the court put it, are the catastrophic effects of racism. These, as the court put it, are the chilling effects of history. And this is of particular relevance today when we have an explosion in incendiary hate speech online leading to an alarming rise also into hate crimes offline. And this brings us to the fifth important objective and dynamic from an educational uh, perspective. And that is the importance of enhancing and implementing the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism, which is the most authoritative, comprehensive, and international definition we have. And what is not so well known, the most representative, a definition adopted over a 15-year period by intergovernmental bodies, governments, parliaments, civil society leaders, scholars, and the like, and which as a non-binding definition is an important resource, an important educational asset, an important 
tool for identifying, recognizing, and defining anti-Semitism. As it is said, if you can't define it, you can't combat it. Number six is the importance of testimonies, which you know only uh, so well. The importance of testimonies and stories of bearing witness. So as Eloise El said, we then become witnesses ourselves. And finally, the importance of rescuers like Rao Wallenberg, a hero of the Holocaust, a hero of humanity who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, prevail, and transform history, an inspirational role model for young people. And therefore, in our country pledges uh, to Malmo, we stated that on Holocaust, on, sorry, on Raoul Wallenberg commemorative day, January 17th, we will encourage high schools to teach about the life and legacy of Raoul Wallenberg. In summary, global education, the education that you engage in is the antidote to the resurgent global anti-Semitism. And all this as a core part, as a core objective of the promoting and protecting of democracy, human rights, and human dignity. Merci pour vos remarques. Thank you for your remarks, Professor Kotler. I also thank you for your support for UNESCO and the causes we defend, for your leadership in the fight against all forms of hatred, and for your lifelong commitment to human rights and international justice. Ladies and gentlemen, educational systems are an essential element in any comprehensive effort to address anti-Semitism and any other form of intolerance and discrimination. Teachers, in particular, can play a significant role in raising young people's awareness of the nature and devastating consequences of anti-Semitism and build their resilience to prejudice and the toxic ideologies that drive discrimination and hatred. That is the goal of UNESCO and ODS cooperation in developing materials for policymakers, teacher trainers and school directors to help them address anti-Semitism in and through education. This is also the purpose of UNESCO's and the United Nations work in partnership with the World Jewish Congress to help educators confront Holocaust denial and distortion, in particular online. It is why I am pleased to launch the Eyewitness webpage to better equip teachers to address anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is on the rise globally. That's why education is becoming more and more central. It is fundamental that teachers, educators get access to ready-made, hands-on materials, educational materials, resources that they can use to empower students to resist hate. In order to support educators, the USC Shoah Foundation partnered with UNESCO and OSC ODIR to develop a dedicated page on the eyewitness platform. This page provides access to guidance and resources to support teachers in their efforts to teach about and prevent anti-Semitism. The page contains the UNESCO and ODIR curricula to help primary, secondary and vocational school teachers and directors to address anti-Semitism. Teachers can explore lesson resources and activities tailored for different age groups in six different languages. Teachers and students can directly engage with clips of testimonies from experts about anti-Semitism and from individuals who experienced anti-Semitism before and during the Holocaust, after World War II and in contemporary times. But I think anti-Semitism in its fullest sense is not just a prejudice. It's actually, it's a worldview. Uh, it's a conspiracy theory. It's a, a, a whole set of ideas and beliefs all of us at UCL Center for Holocaust Education congratulate UNESCO, ODEA, OSCE and the Shoah Foundation in partnering on this cutting-edge initiative to address anti-Semitism through the world-class eyewitness program. It will be a critical tool for accessing the diversity of voices affected by anti-Semitism so that educators, policymakers, students and young people can truly grasp the dangers of anti-Semitism if it's left unchecked. We at UCL will certainly be using the resource with the thousands of teachers that we train and we advocate that others use it too. It will make a difference and we must make a difference if we are to take anti-Semitism seriously and stem its dangerously rapid increase around the world.
I now give the floor to Corey Street, Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation, who will moderate a panel discussion on the role of education and educators in addressing anti-Semitism. Good morning and thank you, Corel. I'm delighted to be here with my uh, colleagues who are doing the good work of countering anti-Semitism. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists today to introduce themselves when they um, answer the first question that we have for them. Um, this is a particularly important work right now and at the USC Shoah Foundation, we're delighted to be part of this panel, but it, part of the, the fight against anti-Semitism more broadly. So we're gonna start this morning with a question to Melissa Mott on why we need to address anti-Semitism through education. Melissa? Sure, um, thank you so much, Corey. And I'm just very, very thrilled to be here. So I'm Melissa Mott, I'm the project director for Echoes and Reflections at ADL. So I'm gonna speak a little bit to the question of why we need to address anti-Semitism through education. Um, and I'll start with just sort of defining it and making a big picture um, sort of statement. It's complex anti-Semitism. It's very deeply rooted in our societies. Um, and so sort of beyond attacking the Jewish community, anti-Semitism shows up um, more frequently as a weapon in our media, our culture, and our political systems, right? So when, when it remains unchecked, it can endanger democracy and it harms both Jews and other marginalized groups. So specifically, there are three reasons that I'll talk through um, as far as uh, why education is the right sphere to address anti-Semitism. Um, first, because we need to address it in formal spaces, um, like classrooms, sort of to counteract what's happening in more informal spaces. Um, and what I mean by this is students are encountering anti-Semitism in places like TikTok, right, where they see a video on Holocaust denial or watching YouTube and the next video sort of pops up and it's a conspiracy theory or something on Jewish control or power um, or even a friend that's using a group or a slur in a group chat. Um, so there's sort of like a vein of misinformation, right, that students are being exposed to and formal education spaces can counteract that. Um, if we're trying in education to prepare students for life, this is what's happening in their lifetimes, right? So it's our job to sort of help them make sense of that. Um, and the second why is really about how we frame anti-Semitism and how we teach to its complexity. So we know that um, anti-Semitism impacts Jewish students personally, but we also know that its rise can sort of indicate a broader weakening of our democratic institutions. So with a classroom intervention or approach, um, is really important because history curriculum can, and it also should sort of thread the needle in balancing that yes, anti-Semitism is a bias and it's a personal prejudice, but it's also this very deeply seated political animus, right? That sort of colored centuries of world history. So talking about the protocols of the elders of Zion, right? In, in conversation with pogroms in Russia or talking about the insurrection and events of January 6 with an understanding of how anti-Semitism um, plays into sort of conspiracy minded thinking, right? So history education really is a space where anti-Semitism education belongs. Um, and this last reason that I guess I'll use is to really address anti-Semitism in a classroom um, because it is the place in a classroom where we build empathy and we expose students to differences, right? So ideally we do this before the void of like not knowing about a group of people is filled with things like misinformation or stereotypes or tropes. Um, so Echoes and Reflections, my, the program that I am the director of, which is a partnership program between ADL, USC Shoah Foundation and Yad Vashem. And it's really been quite a gift um, that Shoah has captured the histories of survivors of genocide before they passed away. So students are listening to these testimonies in our curriculum and they're hearing about things like the Nuremberg Laws or Kristallnacht, but they're also listening and watching as someone's voice shakes, right? Or seeing a survivor like look into the distance when they talk about friends who might've turned their backs on them. And they're real people, right? With dignity and with emotions. And so students are able to sort of connect to this undercurrent of humanity that can help build a shared understanding, right? So anti-Semitism education can sort of help along those three lines to both connect with a, a current of humanity to utilize formal spaces, um, to address things that they're encountering in informal spaces, and then to sort of talk about anti-Semitism, not just as a personal prejudice, but also as a sort of global phenomenon. Thank you, Melissa. 
um, a wonderful answer to kick us off. And now we're going to change tact and think about what challenges are faced by educators addressing anti-Semitism. And I'd like to welcome Esra Ozerek. And again, please introduce yourself to the audience. Okay, thank you so much. I'm really honored to be part of this panel. I am Esra Özürek. I am the Sultan Kabus Professor in Abrahamic Faiths and Shared Values at the Faculty of Divinity, University of Cambridge. Um, but by training, I am an anthropologist. And the, what I will share now today comes from my fieldwork experience um, in Germany, where I did a lot of observation in um, uh, schools where majority of the students are of immigration background. So what I say is not generalizable to all education contexts, but I think it says something that some of them are. Um, so I would say one challenge is that I think it is the case for, um, you know, maybe many teachers, but especially in such contexts, teachers are not familiar with the life worlds of their students and especially about the kinds of um, information or entertainment they consume. I think it is more and more the case in the world. We you know, get information from quite different places and it is the case, especially in continental Europe, majority student, um, teachers are white, middle-class, and then let's say the teacher, uh, the students are immigrants and working class. You know, so different lives, different kinds of information. So the, the communication is quite cut off in um, what I have observed. Um, another challenge that they face, it is specific to the context that I did in uh, these observations, middle class white students know, know how to hide their anti-Semitism. They know the right code words to say things without making that visible or in ways, let's say, that are you, you can say things, but it is okay to say these in German society that are accepted. And now you have the immigrants who say things that are not accepted. You know, so if you, and at the end of the day, you look who commit the anti-Semitic crimes in a country like Germany that I'm familiar, it is 90% by right-wing white, um, you know, ultranationalist Germans. Um, but, you know, even their followers know how to hide it. But Muslim background immigrants do not know how to hide it. I mean, there's of course no, no legitimate reason to be, uh, be anti-Semitic, but then they get marked as the anti-Semites and then the others pass as without, you know, getting any, being reprimanded or, or, or something. And then the final thing I would want to say is that a lot of the public discussions is driven by the conflict in Israel-Palestine and rightly so, the teachers do not know much what is happening. Some students have some partial information. Um, so it also becomes difficult without knowing what is happening and then what is the legitimate criticism of Israel, what counts as anti-Semitism. That also becomes a huge source of um, tension. Um, so yeah, these are among some of the challenges. Wow, thank you. That's a, um, a very insightful way of looking at um, this challenge. Felisa, we're going to move to you next and think about what educators and the education systems need to do to uphold human rights in this context. Great. Felisa? Thank you, Corey. Thanks, Corey. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Uh, so my name is Felisa Tibbetts, and I'm Chair in Human Rights Education at Utrecht University in the Netherlands and UNESCO Chair in Human Rights and Higher Education, also a lecturer at Teachers College at Columbia University. I really am pleased that, there, um, that you've invited me to talk about human rights in the context of anti-Semitism. That's sort of my, my wheelhouse, what I spend time focusing on. The United Nations Human Rights Framework includes principles such as non-discrimination and also rights such as the right to freedom of speech, health, privacy, life, liberty, and security. And under free speech, people have the right to express their opinions, of course. However, offensive speech can become hate speech and cross the line into human rights violations if it encourages discrimination 
and incites violence towards a group or person. So I want to be clear about that. Addressing hate speech doesn't mean limiting or prohibiting freedom of speech. It does mean keeping hate speech from escalating into something more dangerous, um, particularly incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence, which is prohibited under international law. So I kind of want to give that backdrop to um, to my answer to your specific question, Corey, what must educators and education systems do to uphold human rights? First of all, understand what human rights are <laughs> because it's almost uh, a cliche that educators and, edu uh, and um, national curriculum systems really don't um, address human rights in any meaningful and deep way. Um, so in order for it to have any meaning for for education systems and educators, they need to know what are human rights norms and legal standards and what they can offer schools. Um, human rights is not just content. It's not simply historical facts like the founding of the United Nations and the publishing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as important as it is for schooling systems to incorporate them in their national frameworks. That's not the beginning and end of human rights. It also con concerns deep engagement with the ethics of non-discrimination and the rights of vulnerable groups and solidarity with them in protecting and ensuring that human rights are respected. So the gold standard of human rights education involves the heart, the head, and the hand. Um, with this understanding, human rights education should be in the national curriculum, not as an ideology, but as a framework of how to live together in ways that respect everyone's human dignity. It can intersect with other value systems or laws that have the same agenda, but it's also a distinct one in particular because it's international. Um, we can also develop curriculum strategies that promote inclusion and diversity, which protect um, proactively work against othering and bias. I'm sure the work of ADL and others on this panel reflect that effort. Uh, respect for diversity, understanding human rights, uh, learning to live together. Um, there's a lot of tools out there already for educators and education systems to use if there's political will um, to address um, issues like uh, non-discrimination and problems like hate speech. And pedagogy is essential. Learning about human rights or using a human rights-based approach for addressing problems such as hate speech and anti-Semitism calls for open discussion and critical analysis in the classroom and critical analysis even of the human rights framework. The human rights lens itself using that language can open up the opportunity to discuss sensitive and controversial issues and, um, and if so, no student that's studying human rights or considering hate speech or anti-Semitism should be left unaffected by this curriculum because it's a call away from, from an action. So in my final note is only just if we are going to have human rights in the classroom and if we're going to use that as an opportunity to address hate speech and anti-Semitism, let's be sure that it really touches students' everyday lives, right? Human rights can be out there, lofty ideals, ideology even, but we need to have, um, help our students think about equality, discrimination, justice, and even vulnerability in their own lives and the lives of their classmates and communities. Thank you, Felisa. I think your point about making it relatable to students is, is crucial, and particularly when we're talking about curriculum, and I know we're going to go back to Melissa and think about curriculum, and, um, and just to acknowledge the great work that UNESCO is doing and trying to in, um, create that political will that you also talked about and, um, and try to, uh, to move this um, has been uh, su showing such leadership um, with colleagues at ODIR as well. So Melissa, talk to us about curriculum, pedagogies, policies that can help teachers address the specifics of anti-Semitism and what are those specificities? How do we support teachers in this task? And I hope you're gonna talk about the new eyewitness website. Um, that they're there to help with the guidelines, but but of um, course, um, <laughs> want to plan that. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, um, great. I love this question. Those are all my favorite things. Um, so I'll <laughs> I'll start with pedagogy. I also wanted to say, in particular, that I was excited to be here with Dr. Tibbetts because she was my professor of human rights education at Teachers College. So her. Um, ideas and research on pedagogy and human rights education informed my own sort of practice and design. So just a just a quick side note. Um, 
and and I'll I'll talk a little bit too about the eyewitness the new eyewitness website and just sort of like what how that um, has played into how we organize our content and see pedagogy through uh, and anti-Semitism education through that lens. So uh, I'll start with defining pedagogy, which we we know, but uh, just for virtue of um of my my talking points themselves, we'll have a one working definition. So pedagogy is all of the everything, right? It's kind of how I think about it. Um, the sort of connective tissue between ideas so you can have all the amazing primary sources on anti-semitism that you want but like without pedagogy uh, none of it really matters right um it's an area where we can really help to practically support teachers by giving them training and resources like eyewitness um, to understand how pedagogical approaches to anti-semitism work and a simple definition for pedagogy really is just like the how and how we teach about it and a set of beliefs for how it, how it should be taught a certain subject um, so, for example, it echoes those beliefs uh, include a couple of tenets, so it's teaching the human story at the center of the Holocaust, and we use um, the USC show as uh, testimonies and the, the sort of organization of the eyewitness uh, page in order to support teaching about the human story at the center of subjects like the Holocaust and genocide. Um, we also use social emotional approaches, um, and those are very ingrained in the way that eyewitness content and material is presented as well. Um, we really deeply believe in trying to utilize culturally relevant teaching practices, right? So taking into account students' identities and experiences, um, and, and Dr. Tipp has talked a bit about this as well, um, and encouraging allyship sort of as a response to anti-Semitism. So, um, not just sort of teaching uh, a ton of content information for students and then expecting them to magically change their behaviors, but instead um, tasking them with very specific, actionable sort of ways forward for allyship um, and asking them to channel their learning into action, right? Um, and there's some newer, more nascent ideas in pedagogy using theories like inoculation against extremism when we teach about anti-Semitism, um, which is a particularly interesting sort of thread to pull at. And I'll say paramount in all of those approaches is examining emotion as a source of knowledge, right? Of social knowledge and political and ethical knowledge. So we want students to emotionally connect with a subject. And that doesn't mean like by any stretch that we're gauging success when we teach about anti-Semitism or the Holocaust on like making students cry, right? That's not success. Um, but it does mean that we don't shy away from difficult emotions and that we try to leave space for them in a classroom culture, right? So in Echo's content, again, this looks like centering the human story as the focal point when we talk about intolerance and genocide and really using testimony of survivors to ground teaching um, in voices of individual people who experience history. And another approach to make sure that we're sort of coding all of this in is about inquiry-based pedagogy. Um, so like resisting the urge to, to lecture, it's really tempting to like rocket information at students, right? Um, Anti-Semitism has thousands of years of historical background attached to it. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity to just tell them things. Um, and we all probably grew up with that framework. Um, and so instead, inquiry-based learning obviously allows for student discovery and it, and, and it opens up learning um, for students. So I think about a testimony like Leon Bass, for instance, in the Eyewitness Archive. I would encourage you to watch this one. Um, he was an African-American GI who liberated Buchenwald, and he intertwines in his testimony his experiences of growing up um, as a Black man in America, seeing dehumanization and genocide firsthand as he liberated Buchenwald. And then he sort of positions the Holocaust as something that happened not only to Jewish people, but also that happened to humanity like writ large, right? So when we listen to the individual voices of people um, by using testimonies in the, uh, on the eyewitness page with students, um, there, these connections are made by virtue of talking about our shared experience, right? Um, and, you know, I would say also that culturally relevant pedagogy is the one of the most key assets in talking about anti-Semitism in the United States context. Um, as somebody who taught in Newark, New Jersey, I taught primarily Black and Latinx students. And so it was important to me when I was in the classroom to talk about anti-Semitism as it relates to like a broader matrix of oppression, right, to how it relates to anti-Black racism, LGBTQ phobia, ableism, um, so teaching how it animates white nationalism and talking specifically about connection points, right? Like about how the Jim Crow laws were in conversation with the Nuremberg laws, um, both in, in as a historical conversation and as a framework to sort of understand dehumanization. Um, and last, I'll just quickly touch on this new sort of nascent field um, of inoculation. 
that we're sort of trying to develop pedagogy around. So it uh, that that is a very sort of rooted in um, combating extremism, and it helps to um, ask people to like sort of build mental antibodies like a vaccine by briefly exposing them to a weakened message. Um, and then very, very thoroughly refuting it. So we found as a pedagogy approach that it's effective um, in, to combat something like Holocaust denial or stereotypes of Jewish power um, in a controlled environment, sort of. So saying something like, you know, can you believe that the Holocaust, people think the Holocaust didn't happen, et cetera. And then sort of using, bringing in factual information um, to slowly combat that. So I'd say that those, and I could again talk about pedagogy <laughs> for the rest of the hour, um, but those are those are the leading sort of approaches. And then all of that grounded in this idea of the human story, um, which testimony is central to. Great. Thank you, Melissa. What a, a, a deep and thoughtful answer um, getting us thinking. Felice, I want to come back to you and think about, I mean, Melissa's already sort of, you know, um, uh, tested it that way. What is a human rights approach to preventing discrimination and hate speech, including anti-Semitism in that context? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad to have coming right after Melissa because she's touched on so much that I, I don't need to. And I would love to hear you talk for another hour about all the pedagogies that you're engaging with the ADL and with partners. Wow, that is so exciting. And the inoculation approach I hadn't heard before makes so much sense. Let's put it in teacher training so that teachers are also right able to deal with these difficult issues and other sensitive and controversial issues as well. Terrific. I think what I'll address is a little step a little bit outside the classroom because it has been addressed so well by Melissa and maybe Ezra will take it up as well uh, and think about the human rights approach, the human rights based approach in preventing discrimination, hate speech, including anti-Semitism like in the in the education system as a whole as a whole. So first is to say the obvious is, is to locate discrimination and hate speech within a wider human rights framework that recognizes the importance of combating all forms of prejudice and discrimination. I'm sure that all of us who are involved in um, combating anti-Semitism recognize that we have to address all the other, um, you know, the other potential um, uh, groups facing discrimination as well. And Melissa also alluded to that. The rights-based approach is also as a principle of inclusion. So just to make it um, explicit, I think it's important that we include a range of stakeholders in efforts to prevent discrimination and hate speech. And in the human rights world, there is a distinction between duty bearers and rights holders. And duty bearers in the, um, the battle against anti-Semitism would include legislators and policymakers, the criminal justice system, educational managers, teachers and even parents. And the duty bearers have a responsibility to respect, protect and promote human rights vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, the rights we've discussed earlier in my presentation, not just the freedom of speech, but also of course, um, the right to security, personal uh, safety and, and so forth. Um, there's also a role for civil society. Um, many of us on this panel are in civil society organizations and rights holders to hold governments accountable for developing laws that are effective and implemented to prevent anti-Semitism and other forms of discrimination because prevention is obviously the, the, the tool we're all in most interested in on this panel because it leads up to, it links up with education. And of course, learners themselves also have rights and responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis human rights. Um, hate speech is part of a larger challenge for schools to prevent all forms of intimidation and harm against vulnerable groups. So there's a rights-based approach that looks at the whole school approach. And I think I just want to touch on that before I conclude my comments. And a whole school approach um, addresses not only classroom teaching and learning processes, but also school policies and practices, um, the culture um, of the school, uh, partnerships with um, organizations um, outside of the school premises, the, UN, the United Nations UNESCO calls it the child-friendly schools approach. And what we can do with the whole schools approach pertaining to um, combating um, discrimination and hate speech and including anti-Semitism is to create reporting mechanisms when hate speech does take place 
at a variety of levels, at the school level and on up through the education system uh, with clear codes of conduct. So there's accountability if, if there is um, hate speech detected and, and it's reported and there is, um, again, accountability. There should be clear repercussions. Um, maybe create an awareness campaign in schools that among students, teachers, and even parents that hate speech hurts, that it inflicts pain and can cause a, can lead to a host of psychological problems, that there are consequences for people individually experiencing hate speech if they're a member of the group that's been targeted. And obviously problems with hate speech, discrimination often have to do, are linked up with other problems in schools like bullying or disinformation. And I think this was also alluded to in the panel already. So schools also need concurrent policies to combat bullying, disinformation, um, basically all forms of intimidation and harm against vulnerable groups. And, you know, maybe we can think creatively about ways that teachers can also work with students inclusively in trying to combat hate speech, like creating campaigns in the school. So I think there's a lot of creative thinking we can do around whole school approaches that's consistent with the rights-based approach. And I would love to hear actually some ideas from other panelists um, on that. Before I let you off the hook very quickly, Felisa, just a follow up. Um, can you just say a little bit about how you think you raised the issue of, of let's take it to uh, teacher trainers, let's take it to, um, you know, how do we train the teachers? How do you think we can teacher trainers best support teachers to address anti-Semitism, including all of its specificities, complexities that you've raised? Oh, uh, thanks for the question and, and for highlighting that as a need. Um, I think that there are many, I think that the tools exist for us to use with teachers because they're tools that they would themselves use in the classroom. So my, in my own experience working at Teachers College um, at Columbia is to introduce learners to, um, to, to activities and strategies that they can, they can take right into the classroom if they choose to do so. And, um, and also to think about their own roles in the classroom. I think it's difficult for teachers to, um, to address sensitive and controversial issues. I mean, it's it's tough, it's tough. I mean, not just hate speech and anti-Semitism, but in general, and there's not a lot of necessarily support given to teachers in the classroom from their administrators or in their teacher training around that. So I think teacher training can, um, writ large, help educators address sensitive and controversial issues, giving them strategy, activities they can do in the classroom. This idea that Melissa mentioned of inoculation, I like. I think that that's the same thing that can happen in teacher training around educators being willing to either integrate, um, exp you know, intentionally into their curriculum uh, controversial issues like, like you know, the naysayers for the Holocaust, and and. Um, and have that somehow be addressed in the curriculum as a as a of a very difficult points of view that are being circulated that are you know that are that need to be nipped in the bud if you will, um, but also helping teachers un understand when there's a learning moment something happens in the news they and they're coming to the classroom with their students and they can choose to address or not address a very very difficult issue which as Melissa said earlier will be addressed in the non formal sphere if it's not addressed in the classroom so providing them with the courage and the skill sets to be able to do that so I think you know Corey it's a it's a combination of having strategies like opinion lines and debate and and also dealing with misinformation, digital literacy. These are all skill sets teachers need that they can pass on to their students. And there's so many of them. And UNESCO and other organizations have many, many tools that, that can be used, but the space needs to be created in teacher training and not in a, a course on human rights education, which is not a course that every teacher takes before going in the classroom. Thanks for the question. Thank you. And that's so important um, of what you're saying. And again, just thank you to UNESCO for doing the work of convening and bringing many of those resources that teachers can take right into the classroom. Um, and we've been uh, proud to work with them to put that um, in, a, uh, in a space and I witness that teachers can easily access. But all of this requires research. And coming back to you, Ezra, can you talk about how your research studied programs that targeted Holocaust education at minority communities in Germany what lessons can we draw from that research when we're talking about educating to address anti-Semitism? 
Okay, yeah, my um, answer will relate well both to Melissa and Felisa. Um, you know, I, sh I should also say that I went to Germany to um, look at Holocaust memory culture as someone, you know, who is Turkish, who is coming from a country that dealt or didn't um, deal with its past at all. Um, so I was, you know, very impressed, wanted to learn, but my research also made me aware of how Holocaust memory culture in Germany has failed to integrate minorities into it, has totally left them aside. Um, so how did this happen? Until the 2000s, the general approach was uh, to tell minority students, this is not your issue. You know, just do something else. To white students, they would say, go ask your grandfather, you know, what he did do during the war and then learn, you know, what was happening. But to a Turkish student, Kurdish student, honey, you know, just do, do you know, spend your time doing something else. So already that was a huge mistake, right? You know, Holocaust is for all of us to learn, no matter who committed it, who was the victim. I mean, of course, those are hugely important, but what an opportunity it is for all of us to learn from. Then in 2000s, the, you know, wind blew totally the other way around. And then the idea was that no, Muslim background um, people are the anti-Semites. They are the ones who should be taught the um, Holocaust. Now, you know, the white Germans have learned their lessons. Okay, they have more to learn, but now it is their turn to teach to Muslims. Um, and then there was also a lot of pressure on them that they are the anti-Semites and they do not empathize with the Jewish victims. You know, so we have to make this go. You know, so all these programs and all these huge amounts of money were dedicated to teach the Holocaust and uh, you know, uh, anti-Semitism prevention to the minorities. Um, so I have observed tons of education activities and I have noticed that, and also many people concur that, um, there is an expectation that when you learn about the Holocaust that you will exit the camp with a similar feeling, that you should be feeling regret, remorse, and having learned from it. This may be the feeling where, you know, a child whose grandfather was a Nazi would feel like that, of course, you know, we hope that they feel like that. But when a racialized group who has to deal with neo-Nazis, who has to deal with everyday racialization, doesn't exit the camp with those feelings. Sometimes they would um, experience fear. They would say things like, what if this happens to us again? Um, and things like that. Then, they, there would be a lot of criticism from the teachers. They would say, oh, if you feel like that, go back to your own country. How can you do that? You know, this, this is, uh, they, then this is, um, you know, uh, relativizing the Holocaust, comparing to your little everyday racism, how dare you? You know, so that I feel is a major mistake and a major missed opportunity. I mean, of course, you, we cannot compare the Holocaust to everyday racism that you confront on the street or the job market or even, I don't know, be, being beaten up on the street. But still, empathy is an emotional thing and we empathize from where we are. You know, if, we, if the Holocaust education will be for everyone, which it should be, then it, it should be accepted that people will leave the Holocaust education with diverse emotions. The way they empathize with the Jewish victims will come from where they are in the society. Um, you know, so openness to that, I believe, uh, will be the key to fight with anti-Semitism and racism. Well, that's a remarkable finding, um, um, and thank you for that. And before I ask each of you for one final comment, um, Melissa, just a follow up. One of the things we haven't really addressed is, you know, is there something specific or, um, uh, you know, specialized that we need to think about in teaching students who have already developed anti-Semitic attitudes? So what do teachers do when they're faced with those um, kids in the class? Is there some um, you know, thought given to that um, pedagogically from an approach? Um, what do you think about that? Um, from, a, 
from the from the pedagogy lens, I would say it's a complicated question to answer. And I would say that there is a like I already mentioned inoculation, right? Like this idea of actually bringing those I, those anti-Semitic ideas into conversation. Um, I would say leaning very deeply and heavily into the humanistic aspect of teaching about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism when talking about the development of anti-Semitic ideas that may exist already. I think it is paramount for the two approaches. One, which actually just openly discusses how anti-Semitic ideas evolve, where they come from, what their history is. I think a lot can be done or a lot can be realized from a student perspective um, in, when we really trace the sort of lineage and the DNA of a conspiracy theory like anti-Semitism, right? When we're actually like going back and looking at each particular um, historical inflection point where this, uh, this phenomenon has been invoked. Um, and demystifying that for students, I think can do a lot of work when anti-Semitic attitudes have already been developed because it, it, to bring them into the learning like that is impactful. Um, and I would also say that like, again, and I know I keep saying this, but like heavily, deeply leaning into the human story. And if, if those ideas are already being developed, looking at things like testimony that are really specifically presenting you with the impact of those ideas, like, Yes, they are just words and ideas at this level, but as they escalate, they can harm actual people. And here are some of those people that have been harmed and sort of trying to negotiate a, a more complex emotional response from students by using voices of actual survivors of genocide and actual Holocaust survivors who may see anti-Semitism sort of rising again in society now. Um, and, and again, leaning into um, trying to put a face to how those hatreds can impact um, society as a whole. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, um, Esra, any last any last thoughts before we um, oh, we bring the panel to a close? Yeah, I mean, my hope is that you know, fight with anti against anti-Semitism continues, gets stronger. You know that um, um, you know the the specificity of anti-Semitism is emphasized over and over again. But at the same time, that it is never used as a tool to um, further marginalize and racialize already racialized groups, that it is not used as a tool of racism. So that is my hope. Okay. Melissa, any last remarks? Um, <laughs> if I think teachers need help right now um, and they need lots of support, uh, things in the education landscape in the last couple of years have been hectic, confusing, and overwhelming to say the least. Uh, visit eyewitness the new eyewitness page, 16 languages worth of testimonies, use them and the activities to help support teachers like a supply trench that's going to help them because they're on the front lines right now. Teaching about history is something that they're now under attack for doing in many places in the United States. Keeping that in mind, how can we use anti-Semitism and Holocaust education as a vehicle to expose, to discuss, to talk about systems of oppression? Um, supporting teachers, again, being the most paramount undercurrent in all of that. From practical resource standpoint to sort of like more involvement in activist standpoint. Great, thank you. And uh, last, Lisa, any last comments from your perspective? Uh, not too much to add, but to reinforce the importance of supporting teachers. Um, it has been such a tough last two years for teachers, not only in terms of coping with the pandemic, but also so many of these worrisome trends, anti-democratic trends we've seen in so many societies. and. Anti-Semitism, as it was stated earlier in this panel, is a red flag for other really serious problems with democratic institutions. And um, I have also been very discouraged, frankly, by the, you know, the struggles we're having in the United States society around defending science <laughs> and its role in schooling. And I, 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 I'm still baffled by how we're still have, we're having that conversation. So we do need to support teachers, but I, I think we also have to recognize that, that there's so much else that we, you know, that we need to be addressing as well in society. I do think the only thing I'd add to the, the panoply of pedagogies that's been suggested already, very good ones, is maybe digital literacy and helping teachers and students deal with misinformation and bringing back you know, the science, I, Ezra's research is so interesting, so important. And I'm sure there's much, much else that she could talk about, 
or that we could include in teacher trainings that would help teachers also understand themselves and their students and you know inclinations for othering the importance of you know what what democratic institutions look like how they should function it brings us to a higher order of thinking about uh, schooling and and its role in democratic society so um, a heavy a heavy uh, order a, a long list of things to address needless to say in teacher training and in schools Thank you all. This has been a remarkable panel. Thank you all for your thoughtful contributions. Um, thank you to the, the UNESCO for bringing us together, but also for bringing this wonderful resource uh, together and into being. Um, as you said, Melissa, I think that it is like a supply chain to help teachers at this difficult time. Thank you all. voir réapparaître tous les euh, démons ou les masques de l'antisémitisme euh, traditionnel. Man skämtar kring liksom att ja, det var någon affärsidkare som var lite dyr på sina saker. Då var han en jude. Folk liksom kallas för jude ifall de var snåra bland annat. Cet antisémitisme qui explose, c'est pas ce qui est digne qui me tue. C'est ce silence autour de moi qui est en train de m'achever. Comment c'est possible Il y a beaucoup de rapports, de commentaires, de notes sur des attentats, sur des des situations d'actes criminels, par exemple. J'ai vu les deux premières victimes dans l'entrée. C'est évident, quand on se trouve confronté directement à des personnes au sol, ça change totalement la façon de voir la réalité. Donc je voulais absolument voir, je cherchais mes enfants. Jonathan, les deux petits-fils ont, ont été assassinés. De la même manière, j'étais marqué par euh, toujours rechercher les derniers instants de, de Jonathan, les derniers instants de vie de Jonathan et, et des enfants. In the weeks after we received emails and phone calls and letters from people all over the world, Jews, non-Jews, Muslims, unfortunately, I also received and read and saw comments about how we brought this upon ourselves. Pas un héros. Je dis un héros, il va pas tuer des enfants parce qu'ils sont juifs. Et Mohamed Mera, euh, c'est pas un héros, c'est un lâche. Un héros se bat pour la vérité, un héros se bat pour la justice. L'Europe est en train de se choisir euh, son avenir. Ça me concerne moi en tant qu'être humain, ça me concerne, ça nous concerne tous. Ingen blir nazist över natt, så kommer du inte bli av med er över natt heller. Siktigt arbete där samtal ifrån tidig början, liksom, när de här åsikterna börjar ses. I have the right to believe that the world is a rotten place, but I don't. But today I'm also interested to spread the word. Because people don't know. Whatever you do, don't hate. Because it's going to consume you too, eventually. Love your neighbor as thyself.
Facing the visible symptoms of anti-Semitism is only half the battle. We must also understand and tackle its root causes, which is why UNESCO is committed to educating people about where hatred can lead. We need education that is more open to the world and to others. We need an education that fosters a sense of commitment and critical thinking. We need media and information literacy and responsible civic engagement online and offline for human dignity and respect for all. Our new website provides educators and students with the resources they need to address anti-Semitism. We trust it will inspire them to stand up to all forms of hate and to become agents of justice and social change. Thank you for joining us.